The Gospel reading today is the same as it was last week. Um, you can't read these things too many times. Uh, I will uh, read it uh, straight through this week, unlike what I did last week. So very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. And therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. And then the wolf scatters the flock attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said he is demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? This is the reading of the word of our Lord. You may be seated. Now I hope you remember some things from last week, since we are preaching the same sermon two weeks in a row. What the heck? Isn't that fun? Yeah. So, the art of shepherding we're talking about. Do you remember some things? The gate. You remember about the gate? It's rocks, isn't it? You pile up. Yeah. You remember about the voice? How sheep will actually divide themselves based on the voice of their shepherd? Uh, Do you remember that the Pharisees didn't understand what he was talking about because they have no clue what it is to be a shepherd? Hmm? And how about the hired hand? Who was the hired hand? Do you remember? Yeah, me and the Pharisees were the hired hand, um, and um, you just can't count on us. That's what Jesus said. Um, You can't count on us, but who can you count on? Him, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the way it works. Um, So I hope that Um, Oh, there's one other thing that I wanted to remind you of uh, from that passage. Um, I have sheep that are not of this sheep pen. Do you remember that? Do you remember how important that is to us? Because it means that Jesus includes us in his salvation plan. If he didn't have that there, it would be only the Jews that were included in that salvation plan. So, a lot of shepherd imagery in the Bible. I then, if you recall, went on to the 23rd Psalm last week. And the 23rd Psalm I used as an example of how Jesus does his shepherding 
ministry. This explains kind of in detail the things that Jesus does in his shepherding ministry. Uh, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. I uh, hope you remember that he is an active shepherd. He's doing these things for us. Um, he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths. Uh, he's a faithful shepherd, and he feels responsible for us. He is responsible for us. Um, you might recall that I told you he comforted us with his rod and his staff. Do you remember that? He comforts us with his rod and his staff. Now, rods and staves are used for poking and prodding and uh, reminding uh, the sheep where they need to be going at any given time. So they um, can be a little painful at times, right? But God uses that to guide and discipline us. So it means that we will have some painful times in life, won't we? As he redirects us back onto the path that he knows is best for us. So guidance and discipline comes from his rod and his staff. Um, and here's the most joyous part of this. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So in spite of all the evil that surrounds us, in spite of all the people that hate us, in spite of all the turmoil, turmoil that those people cause, Jesus is out there taking care of us, celebrating with us. Because when Jesus prepares a table, folks, that's a celebration. And it happens right in the midst of all of this chaos that's going on around us, of all of the evil that is around us. Isn't that powerful? It's so powerful. I just love it. So uh, it ends with, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. We are confident. That's the surely part. We are confident because he's a faithful. And he will be faithful in this life. Um, it says all the days of my life, right? He'll be faithful in this life. And then it goes on to say, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So God is faithful in this life, and he's faithful to take us into the next life, right? It's important. I had somebody come to me one time in my, um, in my um, church in Presque Isle, and he said to me, you know, I just get tired of hearing that all this eternity stuff, all this afterlife stuff, all this live forever stuff. What's God doing for me now, here, today, in this world? I don't think we talk about that enough because God takes care of us in this world and in the next. Everything he asks us to do is for our own good. It's not for his. He doesn't need all these things. He asks us to do these things for us so that we, why do we pray? It changes us right here when we pray. That's why we pray. God tells us to do it. He commands us to do it. And yet what we think we're directing uh, these, uh, God, we're telling him what to do. Uh, yeah, maybe not so much. I mean, we may think we're trying to, but uh, God does what he knows is best in spite of what we tell him, and it changes our hearts when we pray. So, if we are to shepherd like Jesus, and we're into new material finally here, um, if we are to shepherd like Jesus, we need to ask ourselves some questions. The first one is, are we active in people's lives? Now, I'm taking the same things we talked about in the 23rd Psalm and now applying it to us. Because I truly believe that Jesus wants us to participate in the ministries that he did, okay? And that he is still doing in this world. He calls us to be a part of those ministries. It's what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. 
and it gives our lives purpose. I said in my thank you note that being here with you gives my life purpose. You know, I, I sat during the pandemic for two years without um, doing any preaching, being involved. I mean, I went to a church when it was open, but as you know, many times it wasn't. And um, uh, I, I didn't serve as a pastor during that time. Um, and I didn't realize how much I needed it. <laughs> now, that's just me, you know, and it's as selfish as it could possibly be. But when we are doing what God's called us to do, wow, it changes everything for us. It gives our life meaning, and we all need that in our life, don't we? We need to believe that we're serving a purpose. And all of you have different ways that God's called you. But shepherding ministry is something I believe that we are all called to. So the first one is, are we active in people's lives? Um, we're not good at that. Oh, sure, we keep in touch with our kids and, you know, we, we do some things like that. But to be active in another person's life, it takes a lot of energy, uh, especially people that are incredibly needy. They just, uh, it feels like they suck the life out of you. you know, Jesus is entirely familiar with that problem. Uh, do you remember when the bleeding woman came up and touched his cloak in the crowd? You remember that passage? What did Jesus say? He couldn't possibly have known it bustling crowd that he was in that someone had touched the hem of his garment. He couldn't have possibly known except for one thing. He said, I felt energy go out of me. Remember that? When we participate in other people's lives, energy goes out of us. In fact, that is the whole purpose of participating in other people's lives. When I get done here on Sunday morning, I go home and take a nap. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I try to watch a ball game usually, but um, sometimes I wake up in time to see the final score, and sometimes I don't. So, yeah, energy goes out of us when we're doing ministry. Energy, energy goes out of us when we um, are active in other people's lives, and uh, we are supposed to do that, and it's supposed to work that way. It even worked that way for Jesus. So the first question is, are we active in people's lives the way Jesus was active as a, in his shepherding ministry? The second question is, do we lead people to peace and tranquility? Remember in the 23rd Psalm, what does Jesus do? He makes us lie uh, next to the still waters, right? Yeah. He brings us peace. He brings us tranquility. That's what Christ does. That's what we need to do. How do we bring peace and tranquility into other people's lives? You got any ideas? Well, sometimes we can actually reduce the pressures on them, right? So uh, if there's a chore that needs to be done that they can't do, we can do the chore for them and relieve some pressure that they have in their lives. There's all kinds of stressors in lives, and sometimes it just takes a second pair of hands and we can relieve some of those stressors. But if you wanna bring lasting peace and lasting tranquility to someone else, then you give them Christ. That's how it works. Because he's the only one. Remember, you can't depend on the hired hand, right? No, there's only one that you can depend on, and that's Christ himself. And when the other people learn that, they find peace and joy that they've never had before. We can demonstrate that just the way that Jesus demonstrated to us how this shepherding ministry is done. We can demonstrate it to others, and that will lead them to Christ. 
Are we active in people's lives? Do we lead people to peace and tranquility? And the next question is, are we faithful? It's a really important question. You see, we can't demonstrate Jesus' um, uh, shepherding ministry unless we are also faithful. Jesus is always, always faithful, right? Always. Um, and um, excuse me, I seem to be having a little issue here. His faithfulness is what gives him credibility, all right? We get credibility, how? Through faithfulness. If people see us acting out, you know, that's one of the modern ways that we talk about being unfaithful. We act out. What are they going to think? Do we have anything to offer them? Not really. No. If we're not faithful, then they will not see us as the shepherds or as the guides to the shepherds. They won't see us as being any different than any of the rest of the world. So, are we, next question, are we a comforting presence? Comforting presence. It's important that we be a comforting presence. A comforting presence is, means that maybe words aren't always the best option, right? Maybe engaged in conversation, maybe uh, uh, the hopefulness that might, you might think comes in your words, you know? Words like, um, well, if you need anything, call me. We, we try to find ways to be comforting in our voices, and people know the moment they hear it that they're empty. It's empty words. But you know what they appreciate? Your presence. Your presence. Just being there. If they're crying, cry with them. Yeah. Just being there is powerful and important are we a comforting presence do we celebrate achievements remember when jesus sets that table right in the midst of all the chaos and all of the enemies we can do that too we can bring a little island of hope into people's lives it's a powerful thing to be able to do it doesn't eliminate the problem it doesn't take uh, the enemies away. It just gives us this little island of hope that we didn't have before. We set a table amongst the enemies. Do we celebrate achievements? And the last question I have here is, do people look to us with confidence? Do they have confidence? Remember in the 23rd Psalm, surely... Your goodness. That's that confidence that we have in Jesus. Do people have confidence in us? It takes something called trust, doesn't it? And trust isn't just there. It, it, when you begin a relationship, when you begin being active in a person's life, they don't instantly trust you. Trust is something that you build. People didn't even trust Jesus, did they? And Jesus said, you know, if, if you don't trust the words that I've told you, can't you at least trust based on the miracles that I perform? I've wordsmithed that just a little, but it's important that we do the things necessary to build trust in the lives of others. When we build trust with others, they gain confidence. And when they gain confidence, then they are more likely to find hope and peace and Christ himself. Now, Jesus in John 10 shows qualities like God. He leads them. Um, he knows his voice. Think about that. He talks about 
his father speaking to him. He demonstrates this, this, uh, uh, these things that we talked about in John 10. Um, he uh, talks about being led. He talks about knowing the voice of God. Uh, he talks about his involvement in other people's lives. And he continues to provide for us. And he sacrifices for us. And he ultimately brings us eternal life. All these things we talked about uh, in John 10. So how can we participate in Jesus' shepherding ministry? This is Acts 20, 28. It says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. We're supposed to invest in people's lives. Invest in people's lives. Some of you were teachers. Got some teachers. Uh, I, I, I don't know necessarily the profession of every person that sits in this sanctuary, but um, I can tell you that teachers are one of those that invest in other people's lives, right? In the lives of children. There's lots of other ways to invest in people's lives. And in fact, I would say that in every discipline, there is the possibility of investing in others' lives. We do it by mentoring, right? Especially when we get to this age, we do it by mentoring. And it can be children, it could be young adults, it could be newlyweds, uh, I uh, was uh, involved uh, in a church one time that whenever a couple was married, um, they would be uh, assigned an older couple. They would be paired with an older couple, one who had done many years of marriage. And um, they would build a relationship, those two couples, uh, one mentoring the other a safe place for them to talk, to work through the issues. Marriage is hard. Anybody married that disagrees with that? Yeah. Marriage is hard. It is. Um, it's good. It's hugely rewarding. But it's hard. And uh, one of the ways that we can mentor is to pour our uh, wisdom and experience into the lives of young couples. Uh, who are newlyweds. Uh, one of the biggest ways that we can mentor is to give time. We protect time a lot in our lives, don't we? We protect it carefully. The one thing that we tend to be the most stingy with is our time. Yeah? We don't want to divest of it very easily. And yet, if we're truly going to pour our lives into the life of another, what do we have to give them? It's time. It's time. In fact, it's so important, so incredibly important, that it should be a priority in our schedule to give time to others. That's a hard thing. It's a really hard thing. And I want you to know, <laughs> Jesus never asks us to do the easy things, right? We're not, he never asks us to do the things that we're going to do anyway. No. When, when you go off and, um, you know, you, you do the thing that you exactly wanted to do, and then you give Jesus the credit for that, yeah, maybe not. All right, because Jesus asked us to do the hard things, the things that we wouldn't do if we didn't know him. Giving time is so critically important if we're going to pour our lives into the lives of others. We need to love in order to be good mentors. We need to provide guidance in order to be good mentors. We need to bring peace and joy and celebration and comfort and faithfulness to the others that we pour our lives into. 
All of that is required to be a mentor. Um, some of the things, you know, that we can do. Uh, have you ever heard of Stephen's Ministries? Uh, some churches, usually way big mega churches, um, not churches our size, but uh, have a ministry they call the Stephen's Ministry. Uh, you can look it up if you want, but basically it means that there is a person assigned uh, eight or ten people to keep track of. Now, you can imagine in a church that has five services a week and 2,500 people uh, attending, people get lost in the crowd, right? If they don't show up for three Sundays in a row, nobody's going to know. Stephen's ministries are designed to help keep that from happening. Uh, this person keeps track of these eight or ten people, and uh, they're, everybody in the congregation gets covered that way. And um, if there's issues in the lives of that person, it's brought back to the pastor, uh, the pastoral team usually in a church that side. Stephen's ministry is an intentional ministry that we're going to keep track. We're going to call somebody if they don't show up. Um, we need to do that too. Uh, it doesn't need to be formal, but when you notice that the person in front of you isn't there on a Sunday, call them, drop a line, uh, something, you know, just to let them know they were missed. Uh, and if you find out there's an issue with someone in our congregation, uh, please let me know. I, I got to tell you, I'm always the last to know. Yeah, it's just in any church I've ever served, you know, everybody assumes that I know and no one's told me. <laughs> and so I don't know. Um, we can be good about visiting other people's homes and hospital, and we all need to do it, not just me. Um, we need to build relationships with visitors, and uh, we've talked just a little bit about that. If we have visitors in the congregation, we need to get their name. We need to find out if they'd like to be on the email. We need to follow up with them, not just let them come and disappear and <laughs> never see them again. This is all part of doing what Jesus did, his shepherding ministry. This is John 21, verses 15 through 17. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lamb. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. <clears throat> Who are the sheep? We're all the sheep, right? All of us, yeah. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. We're all called to this shepherding ministry. Basically, Jesus is saying, if you love me, take care of my sheep. It's the responsibility of every Christian. Do you remember ever reading in 1 Peter 2, 5, the, about the priesthood of all believers? Does that uh, ring any bells with anyone? The priesthood of all believers. Well, I don't need to really explain that. It means that all believers are priests at least in that language. All believers are pastors. All believers do ministry. Think of it however you want, but we are all called to take care of the sheep. So, to make disciples, we must be disciples, right? That's the first thing. If we're going to make disciples, we have to be disciples. You can't care for sheep unless you are cared for. It's pretty important. Um, 
Acts 20 says, keep watch over yourselves, not just for faithfulness, but also for health. Um, so you can't take care, uh, you can't care for the sheep unless you are cared for. Um, if we're going to uh, help build discipleship of those around us, we have to have a close relationship with Christ ourselves. It's absolutely necessary. We must have peace in order to bring peace. We must be faithful in order to lead others to faithfulness. We must be joyful if we're going to help others find joy. And you can add as many of those statements as you want. Every positive good thing that we do um, in our shepherding ministry, we have to have done ourselves in order to be of any good to anyone else. God bless.